Hi everyone, as we talked about in the previous video, the first, the vapor pressure of a substance changes as a function of temperature. And uh, as we note also in the um, uh, previous video, the boiling point, which is the uh, temperature at which the vapor pressure of a particular substance equals the atmospheric pressure also changes as a function of elevation because as you go higher and higher in elevation, the um, pressure of the surrounding actually gets lower and lower because there's fewer and fewer gas particles and so a substance that might have a um, normal boiling point uh, of 100 degrees at sea level uh, where the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere will drop its boiling point to 83 degrees when the atmospheric pressure is 0.46 uh, atmosphere okay so uh, what this allows you to do, uh, you know, is, is basically you, you can determine the boiling point at various uh, atmospheric pressure depending on wh whether, you know, if you know the atmospheric pressure or not. And also we talked about in the previous video, of course, the uh, fact that various substances actually, um, you know, depending on their vapor pressure, uh, will boil at different temperature because uh, some substances are more volatile than other substances. So for example, in this case, diethyl ether, uh, which has a much higher vapor pressure at a given temperature compared to something like water, for example, will boil off at a, at a much lower temperature. Now, there's actually uh, an equation that would allow you to basically generate this plot uh, here, the plot of uh, temperature uh, uh, vapor pressure as a function of temperature and that equation is what we call the clausius clapeyron equation. This is an equation that you uh, can actually derive once you learn about uh, more about thermodynamics specifically about enthalpy and entropy um, but right now we're just going to present the equation as a given and basically the way this equation is written um, I'm going to just explain what each of these terms is and I'm going to apply this equation to uh, a particular problem. So the clausius clapeyron equation says on the left side uh, ln of P1 over P2 is equal to on the right side this whole term here which is delta H vaporization over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. So let's just talk about some of these terms here. ln is uh, for some of you who've done this math should know that ln is natural log, so in other words it's basically taking a log of this uh, term in here but it's a natural log so there's a key in your calculator that says ln and you should take ln of this term right here and then P1 and P2 are vapor pressure terms P1 is the vapor pressure value at temperature T1 and P2 is the vapor pressure value at temperature T2 uh, as you know earlier from the plot that I showed you before with uh, each substance, for example water, you notice that at 60 degrees for example water has a certain vapor pressure, at 80 degrees water has a different vapor pressure. So those numbers are the ones that would go into the P1, uh, T1, P2, and T2. You'd say 60 degrees Celsius, you have to express this in Kelvin by the way, um, there's going to be a, a certain value of P1 and then uh, another value of T2 would be uh, give you another value of uh, vapor pressure okay and again I want to make sure that this is actually understood that we're gonna express this in Kelvin okay so I typed in this to, to uh, again emphasize the fact that these temperatures have to be expressed in Kelvin you can't express them in Celsius um, the Delta H VAP term here is basically the Delta H of vaporization in other words you know how much energy does it take to convert um, the uh, the liquid form of the substance to the solid uh, to the gas form okay and there's a particular term that's an endothermic term right because you're gonna require energy to break all the intermolecular forces that exist in the liquid to convert it to the gas form and in the next video when we talk about um, you know energy and um, and the heating curve you'll see that this delta H vaporization term will come again but this is basically is the enthalpy of vaporization the energy needed to vaporize the substance R is your gas constant and in this case it's given as 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin because delta H is an energy term so you have to use the energy term for R what I want to do here is just show you an example how to apply this equation in practice again we're not deriving this equation per se 
uh, in this class, you can, like I said, if you know a little bit more about thermodynamics um, and entropy and enthalpy and uh, Gibbs free energy, you'll be able to derive this Clausius Clapeyron equation. Okay, so let's take a look at the example here and how we can apply the Clausius Clapeyron equation to solve this problem. So here it says that given the following data for lithium, what is the delta H vaporization of lithium? And this is the data that's given here. It's basically the, the, you know, sort of like the table form of the plot that's shown to you before, okay? It's basically the uh, vapor pressure of a particular substance as a function of temperature. Uh, so if you look at this, it says here's temperature at various temperatures in degrees Celsius. Here's the vapor pressure of uh, lithium. So what we need to do is just plug it into this equation and then solve for delta H of vaporization. Okay, so I'm going to do this work in uh, the scratch paper shown here. And as you can see, what I did here was first to just write that clausius Clapeyron equation on the top, ln P1 over P2 equals delta H VAP over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. And I just rearranged this to solve for delta H of vaporization, which is the component that's being asked in the question. And so if you rearrange the equation, you do a little algebra, you'll find that delta H VAP should equal to this expression right here on the right, which is ln of P1 over P2 in parentheses, and then uh, divided by 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1, and then multiply the whole expression by R, the gas constant. And then what I do next is I just uh, plug in numbers. Now, you might wonder, well, which one should I use to solve for this problem? Well, it doesn't really matter because you just need to, what you need to do is pick two temperature values, whether it's these first two or these two or these two or any of the two that you want. You could be first one and last one. Um, and then put in the appropriate values for P1 and P2. And then just be consistent. If you pick this one as your point number one, in other words, this is your P1, then this has to be your T1. And then if this were your P2, then that has to be your T2. What I decided to do is pick uh, point number two and number three again for no, um, you know, no, no other reason than that's the numbers that I decided to pick. Again, you can pick any of the other numbers. Um, and your answer would be uh, not necessarily the same in this case, but it will be exact. It, it would be fairly close to each other. And the reason it's not the same is because this is data and data. There's some error associated with each data point, and that's why the the, the number is not exactly the same. The only the only time you get the exact same answer is if all the data points line on the same, you know, uh, are, are exactly on the line. But in this case, the the data points are not exactly on the line. And that's why you might get variations if you use the first and last data point versus the second and third, which is what I decided to use in this case. But if you were to use second and third, I'm, tr I'm going to use uh, 10 as my P1, which means 890 in Celsius is my temperature one. And then I'm going to use 100 for my P2, which means uh, 1080 in Celsius is my temperature two. So going back here, I plug in my P1 and P2, which is 10 and 100. Notice that I'm not changing the units there. I'm keeping the millimeters of mercury. I could change it to atmosphere, but as you notice, if I'm dividing two numbers, if I'm converting it by, you know, by dividing it by 760 for each one of them, then those 760s will cancel out anyway. So there's no reason for me to change this from the, the millimeters of mercury unit. However, the, uh, uh, it's important for me to change the unit of the temperature to make sure that it is in Kelvin. So in this particular case, I want my T2, which remember was 1080 in Celsius. I have to add 273 to this number, and that makes it 1353. So then it will be 1 over 1353 uh, Kelvin in this case. Now notice I didn't write any units here because I didn't have space, but I'm just going to, this is, should be in Kelvin and then minus one over the other temperature, which remember I chose that temperature to be 890. So then I have to add 273 to this and that results in 1163. And then the whole thing is then multiplied by 8.314, which is the value for the gas constant. If you carry out the calculation, you get a negative number on the top here, but you also get a negative number on the bottom. So those negatives will cancel out. 
Uh, and then if you carry out the calculation further, then what you get as delta H vaporization for lithium in this case is 158.6 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Now again, notice that I didn't write the units out here, but if you were to do that, that's the unit that you would get. You get joules per mole, but you can convert it to kilojoules per mole by dividing it by 1,000. Um, I just want to point out here that delta H vaporization is always a positive number, right? Because it's an endothermic process. You're trying to break apart interactions that exist in the liquid. Remember, they're intermolecular forces that's holding the liquid together. And if you want to convert it to gas, which is what delta H vaporization measures, you have to put an energy in order. So if you're putting energy to the system, that means the process is endothermic. Okay? So that's hopefully clears up an example of how to make calculation using the clausius clapeyron equation. And uh, again, that's going to be useful because that allows you to calculate all kinds of stuff. Let's say if you know what we just did is calculate delta H of vaporization, but let's say we know delta H vaporization and we're interested to know what is the vapor pressure of water at, you know, 32 degrees Celsius. And we know the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius then we can make that calculation, right? We can solve for one of the P's, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a matter of kind of, you know, uh, solving for one of these, these uh, variables that you have here, either P1, P2, T1, T2, or delta H VAP, okay?